Hello, this is Chuck Carnival, co-founder of FastGraphs, the Fundamentals Analyzer software tool. It's my pleasure to present 10 high-yielding dividend growth stocks that are currently fairly valued. With my first research candidate, I'm going to review the healthcare REIT Omega Healthcare Investors. And just for those of you who aren't familiar with FastGraphs, I'm going to start with a very simple illustration of how the tool works. First of all, I want you to note that I'm utilizing funds from operations here and or adjusted funds from operations when evaluating REITs. So I'm going to stay with funds from operations because I have more historical data here. The key with the REIT is that they're required by law to pay out 90% of their distributable income and the FFO reflects how that works quite nicely. So what I've got here is a plotting of FFO from the end of 2004 and including estimates for the years 2019 and 2020. So what I want you to notice here is that funds from operations have grown rather nicely. They flattened quite a bit during the Great Recession of 2008 and more recently healthcare REITs in general and of course Omega specifically have had some weakness in their funds from operations growth. Now the next thing I'm going to add to this graph is going to be the monthly closing stock price and I want you to see how it relates and tracks funds from operations growth here. You see a lot of in between volatility and you also see a very strong reaction over the last two or three years where this REIT's price has dropped. Now some people believe this relates to interest rates. So I'm going to very quickly go down here and look at the P.E. ratio versus interest rates. And what you're seeing here is as we've had a rise in interest rates over the last year or two, still nowhere near their all time norms, we begin to see the price to FFO valuation be dropping on this particular read, as you will see with a lot of healthcare care reads. The next thing I want to add is the normal price to FFO. Historically, this company is traded at around a 10 to 12 price to FFO. As I shorten the time frame where I'm eliminating some of these higher price to FFOs here, you'll notice that that price to FFO drops to 11.7. If I shorten it some more, it drops down to 11. I'll be using later 10 and a half as a kind of a normal price to FFO ratio for this stock. Nevertheless, the key point I'm trying to make here is that you can see that the valuation, even though FFO growth has been weak for the last couple of years and is expected to begin growing modestly again in the future, we see what I would call a significant overreaction action to this company's stock price. The key point here is that there is some weakness in FFO, but we're not talking about a collapsing FFO here. We are talking about an FFO where we had two years of drops, theoretically followed by some growth. So the key is this becomes the most important metric to me. As long as this is staying reasonably stable and or growing, you've got an opportunity. This undervaluation, this is an extremely low valuation. Current price to FFO, blended FFO, is 8.4 as listed here in the fast facts box. But the company as a result of this low valuation is generating a 9.8% yield. I'm gonna put the dividend yield column on here and I'm gonna expand this back out to a longer graph. And I want you to notice that when dividend yields are highest for this REIT historically are periods when the valuation has been lowest. Its company ended last year with a 9.4% dividend yield. And you can see the valuation is currently very low and it has continued to be weak in 2018. So now we have a dividend yield of 9.8% current dividend yield or current distribution yield, if you will, on the REIT, which I argue makes this stock look significantly undervalued. Now, just to round this presentation, I'm going to go ahead and take the dividend yield off. And now I'm going to add dividends and the payout ratio of dividends. And I'm going to shorten the graph here a little bit so you can see it clearly. And you can see this idea that the REIT pays out a majority of its distributable income in the form of dividends. The area below this white line actually represents the payout ratio, if you will, or what portion of this total funds from operations the REIT is paying out. This is an extremely low valuation for this REIT. Now, there's risk in healthcare REITs, clearly, but the bottom line is this low valuation could be creating an opportunity because if I go down to the forecasting calculators, you'll see what I'm talking. What I'm showing here is the three to five year trend line growth FFO forecaster for Omega Healthcare. Now there are only two analysts that are currently offering this forecast. But I also want to point out that I talked about a 10 and a half to 12 PE or price the FFO for this REIT as a normal valuation multiple. So I'm not going up to the orange line here. I'm going to use the more conservative. So shorter run, if the, this were to go back to a 10 and a half multiple of funds from operations, you would have almost a 30% annualized rate 
rate of return over the next two years. Go out another year and that still stays in the 20%. If I go all the way out to 2023, which is obviously going pretty far out here and therefore may not be reliable, you would still have an opportunity to generate a 15.75% total rate of return. But the real key here is that when you look at a REIT like this that's yielding such a high yield, you can see that they've increased their dividend steadily over the years and average about 10% growth. And this company has actually dramatically outperformed the S&P on an income basis. Um, however, it's just about matched it on a total return basis. And that's notwithstanding the company's current low valuation. The bottom line is this REIT looks extremely attractive relative to its ability to generate high income. Here I've stacked the dividends on top of the orange line just to illustrate that total return is a function of the price going from point A to point B plus the dividend income. And that's what we see in the performance report here. We see that dividends have steadily increased. This is based on a $10,000 investment that was started on 12-31-2004. And you can see the dividend income has increased each year for this particular real estate investment trust. Over this time frame, total cumulative dividends have averaged over $18,000 versus only $3,500 in the S&P. So this has been an excellent investment, notwithstanding the fact that it's currently significantly undervalued. With my next research candidate, I'm going to take a look at Amerigas Partners, an MLP that's actually a gas utility. Now here I'm utilizing EBITDA, or earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, to try to give a clear valuation reference. There's a couple of things you need to note. The company is currently yielding 9.5% and trading at a price to EBITDA of 6, which is historically normal for this company over this time frame has been 6.9. So you can see the price is currently below the EBITDA line here, and that's also part of why we have the 9.5% yield. Once again, we see yields tend to be highest when valuations or the price relative to the, in this case, EBITDA, is low. So we have a very nice yield here, but I do want to also point out that this particular stock has only grown EBITDA at about 2.7%. So this is an example of what I alluded to in the written part of the article. This is a very low growth utility, if you will. It does have high current yield. So this would be primarily an option to invest in something that can maybe beef up the yield of your current portfolio. If you look at the dividend record of this company, the growth has been much lower than what we saw with Omega, although there have been a few times where it's been high. This simply connotates quarterly numbers where we didn't have a full number, but you can see it's generated a significant greater amount of dividends or distributions, if you will, relative to the S&P, just like we saw with Omega. But in this case, capital appreciation or growth, if you will, has related very closely to the company's EBITDA growth rate. If you recall, it was 2.7% and it was undervalued. So that gives us a 2.3% annualized rate of return. Now, what's interesting is we are in a dead heat with the S&P 500 here over this time frame from December 31st, 2004. But what we do see here is a significant advantage in the dividend income. So this is a utility that's currently undervalued with a very high yield that might make a great deal of sense for someone that needs to get a little more income out of their pool. With my next example, I'm going to look at Owens and Minor Inc., a healthcare distributor. And analogous to what we saw with Omega, healthcare is obviously under a great deal of stress right now. Um, there's the Amazon effect and a lot of other issues, which I won't get into for sake of brevity in this presentation. But I do want you to notice that we had a drop in EBITDA for 2017. It actually dropped 24%. And we had a very strong reaction by the market. I would call this an overreaction, which creates an excellent opportunity to invest in this small cap healthcare distributor distributor offering a 6.6% yield. Once again, if I look at historical performance, we see a very attractive dividend growth rate. However, I want you to notice it has slowed down dramatically during these time when EBITDA growth has slowed down quite a bit. Once again, we see a tremendous advantage against the S&P. We do see underperformance on a capital appreciation basis. But once again, we see almost a dead heat. Now, this is from December 31st, 1998, which is a little longer time frame than I showed you with the previous example. I would call this clear overreaction to the stress. I would think this stock ought to be trading at around $18 or $19 a share and could potentially be trading as high as $36 a share if the attitude and the sentiment towards healthcare companies changes. If you look at EBITDA here, I'm looking at a normal priced EBITDA 7.6 would generate an unbelievable opportunity to invest in a significantly undervalued stock and generate very high returns with the potential to also get a very high level of current income. The 
key here is though this is almost a speculation at this point because the valuation has gotten so low. With my fourth research candidate I moved to the utility PPL corporation and I've also moved to adjusted operating earnings here because I do want you to see the relationship between price and earnings here. I want you to notice that we had this weakness coming out of the recession of 2001 but then this undervaluation is what gave the opportunity to make some really interesting rates of return. For example just picking a couple of spots here you can see that over this period from May of 02 to December of 06 we ended up annualizing at 19.4 percent. We more than doubled our money and of course generated a rather significant amount of dividend income from this stock. But once again when I apply the dividend yield valuation reference here you can see that the yield is lowest when valuation is highest and the yield is highest when valuation is lowest. And right now we've got a apparent undervaluation with a normal PE of 13.3 the current PE of 12.3 giving us almost a six percent current yield and the opportunity to see some potential. But notice that this company's growth has only averaged 2.2 percent and you might also notice that there's been a modest amount of cyclicality along this the way. When you look at performance you see that this dramatically underperformed the market on a capital appreciation. Again that was the very modest growth reduced by the low current valuation but once again we see a significantly higher yield and we end up with almost a tie in the S&P. So thus far that all the companies we've looked at have been primarily high yield investments that aren't going to necessarily out capital appreciation or out capital gain the market but they can get very close to a total return of the market because of the yield advantage that they offer. With my fifth example I'm going to go back to another REIT Tanger factory outlet currently yielding 5.9 percent has a normal price to FFO of 14.9 we'll call it 15 and you can see the orange and the blue line here are actually virtually superimposed but it's very important in this particular case because I want you to notice that the best returns came if you could have invested this company when valuation is low and held it as valuation got higher and that would also be true coming into Great Recession here if you'd have bought it somewhere here during throes of the Great Recession. I didn't pick the perfect bottom there and even held it today at today's current low valuation you still would generate an 8.6 percent rate of return. Of course from from trough to peak if you will your rate of return ratchets up to about 17 percent. This is why valuation is so important. The long-term track record of this company even at today's low valuation significantly outperforms the S&P 500 on an income basis but also interestingly outperforms it on a capital appreciation. So total return of 11.5 since December of 2000 is more than double the rate that the S&P generated on a total return basis. So if you know there was a time to invest in a REIT like this now would be the time. The valuation is compelling and when you look at it from a standpoint of looking out longer term if this goes back to a normal multiple like it has historically of 15 or 16 I can pick what multiple I choose here. I'm going to go ahead and use that 15.4. I want you to see that the rate of return potential to invest in this particular REIT now not only does it offer you high yield but it does offer potential for very high capital appreciation going forward. So this is Tanger factory outlet. My sixth candidate is Tupperware Brands Corporation and I really think this is a very interesting example because I want you to see the high correlation between price and earnings but also I, I talked about in the written portion of this article you can see these periods when valuation gets out of whack here we have it on the low side but then inevitably comes back into fair value as I mentioned the market's always seeking efficiency although it can be very efficient at any point in time. We saw a similar situation in 2012 and then we saw the opposite in 2013 where valuation the, the PE here I'm using operating earnings in this example was 17.4 at the high and the normal has been about 13 and of course we had that reversion that I referred to where the market you know, became efficient and of course you can see how stock price tracked the dropping operating earnings here but now earnings have begun to recover and you know we've seen a move but here we are again with significant undervaluation giving us a 5.7 percent yield. Note the earnings growth rate here is 6.1 percent which again relates very closely to the capital appreciation this company has achieved even higher than the S&P over this time frame from December 29th 2000 but you also have again a significant dividend advantage and even an annualized total return advantage even though this company is currently undervalued. Forecasts going forward are for growth to continue at about 6.1 percent. 
this would mean the future opportunity for this company could be very significant total rates of return with high current dividend income. My next example looks at the iconic AT&T, but I want to point something out. This is what I like to call your grandfather's AT&T, and this is approximately when SBC Communications bought it. So when I'm evaluating this stock, I like to look at these shorter time frames here, kind of post the Great Recession, if you will, and post when SBC bought it. And you can see the company's grown at about 4.7%, including forecasts going forward for the next couple of years. We can also see the estimates going forward are for 6% growth. And if we then apply a normal multiple to this of about 14, as I talked about, from buying this low growth utility, if you will, or integrated telecommunications company, you could be generating very nice double digit rates of return. And that opportunity comes not from the growth potential going forward because it's actually quite low. It comes from the significant undervaluation that the company is currently trading at relative to historical norms. But once again, you see this correlation where price tracks earnings, in this case, adjusted operating earnings, but it does get disconnected from time to time. And that either creates an opportunity to sell or an opportunity to buy. But as I mentioned, even with a low growth stock like this, had you moderately overpaid for it back in 2012 and held it till today, you would have still had a positive rate of return. You'd have had negative capital growth, but thanks to the high yield, you'd have actually eked out a positive rate of return long term. I consider AT&T an excellent candidate right now for those that are seeking yield. It's not going to give you a lot of growth yield, I call it. The company has only been increasing their dividend by average of about 2% a year. But once again, you see a very high income advantage over the S&P, but you also see very strong underperformance. So here's a classic example of a company that's attractive for those that need a little more yield out of their portfolio, but it's not necessarily gonna make them a, a very high rate of return under normal circumstances. But given that the valuation is currently so low, you now have the opportunity to generate very high annualized rate of returns by investing in this company today strictly based on the fact that you can buy it at such a low valuation with such a high yield. With my next example, I'm going to look at the Southern Company, a very high quality, A- minus rated electric utility company. I want you to notice the very strong correlation between price and earnings as you look at this historical graph. You can see disconnects, and this is a case where if you pay for a high valuation on a low growth stock, even though you can still eke out a little return, you're making a lower rate of return than the company's capable of generating. In contrast, if you buy it at a reasonable valuation, you end up getting a return that's a lot closer to the company's dividend income plus its growth rate. So valuation is critical. This stock is currently fairly valued, not excessively undervalued like some of the others, but it does offer a 5% yield with the opportunity to see some modest dividend growth going forward. But again, because it's a high yield, low growth stock, you're not going to see a lot of growth. With my ninth research candidate, I'm going to go back and look at the REIT Simon Property Group. And once again, I want you to see this very strong correlation between, in this case, funds from operations, because once again, we're looking at a REIT and the company's stock price. And you can see the impact that high valuation has. Here you had a priced FFO of 23 which is almost 50% higher than their normal PFFO of 14.8. And as a result of that high valuation, you end up with a very low 3% annualized rate of return, actually a capital loss, but dividends bailed you out because the dividends have been good here, but it's the price of buying it at a high valuation. Had you bought it a couple of years earlier when the valuation was in line back in June of 2010, your rate of return now goes up to 12% a year, even after this big drop off we saw you know, from last year, from 2017 into this year. Again, the Amazon effect we have here, if you look at long-term performance, you see significant outperformance on both capital appreciation and dividend income relative to the S&P since 1999. I would consider this a very opportune time to be able to invest in this retail REIT and be able to generate some very nice double digit rates of return going forward. My final example is another REIT store capital. And again, we don't have a lot of FFO history here. We only go back to 2015, but you can see that the price and the FFO relationship is very much intact. We see the, the impact of high valuation. We also see the impact of low valuation. This is an attractively valued REIT right now just based on fundamentals and expectations of the future. It doesn't offer a lot of growth, but it does offer a decent current yield. So it might be one that might fit certain investors. I hope you recognize here that with these high yield stocks, 
most of them are really all about the dividend income and not the growth potential. But if you recall Tanger, for example, or even Owens and Miner, you do see some opportunities here to make exceptional total returns going forward. But keep in mind that higher returns always come with higher risk. And this is Chuck Carnival. Thanks for listening.